So basically, I'm going to say a little bit about phenomenology and existential philosophy. I'm taking, I, I felt the need to say something about that just because we're talking about existentialism. Um, I take it that it's not as if phenomenology is one thing and existentialism is another. Um, existentialism is a, a, an important form of phenomenology. Um, and then the rest of it was really talking about the phenomenology of the body. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm not just confining myself to Sartre. I'm going to look a bit at Nella Ponty and also a couple of other uh, phenomenologists like um, Richard Zaner and Dean Nader. And also a little bit at a non-phenomenologist, um, though her work is phenomenologically interesting, namely uh, Julia Kristeva. But basically, it's just going to be identifying some aspects of the lived body that are interesting and trying to say something about them. Um, so. I'm sure I, I, most of this I don't really need to say to this audience. Um, phenomenology is, uh, you know, a, a way of doing philosophy devised initially by Husserl uh, and then taken up by people like Heidegger and Sartre and Meloponti. Um, it's a methodology uh, resulting in a description of the essential structures of human reality. Uh, of, of, of the essential structures of experience and the experience world, or the life world, if you like. Um, and uh, to, if I said that to a philosopher, they might think, well, that could sound very like Kant. The important thing about the phenomenologists is that they're talking about what they talk, call lived space, lived time, lived things in the lived body the experience of and by other people and so on, um, the ways in which these figure in, in our actual experience. Um, but uh, one thing I should also say, that even though this talk is focusing on the lived body, these aspects of human reality, space, time, uh, things, and others, for example, uh, are you know, it's not as though those are separate from the ways in which we live our body. And some of those connections between the lived body and lived space and time and, and others and so on will come out in, uh, in what we're saying. But so you can't really separate the lived body from lived space, lived time, lived things and lived uh, um, others. Um, so. Again, this may all be completely familiar. Um, a basic distinction which you can make in German and you can't make in English um, is between Leib and Körper. Uh, and curiously, I'm sure, are there German speakers in this audience? OK. Um, I, I'll be interested to see what you say here. Curiously enough, I mean, within the phenomenological tr tradition, people do make that distinction between Leib and Körper. Leib is often sort of rendered into English as the lived body and corpor as the sort of body thing um, or something like that. But it was only this last term that I happened to have a German speaking or an actual German student doing Sartre and Meloponti with me. And I just asked her, you know, how those words are used in ordinary German. And she, said, she managed to say a few things that were really kind of interesting. She, and I, I'm curious to know whether you can expand on this. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm really. Um, she, she said that the word "like" was used, particularly in the context of referring to the body of Christ, but also in kind of love poetry. Um, and you, you know, if you used the word "kerper" in, in a piece of love poetry, it seemed somehow rude and crude. But can you say more about that? Yeah. 
that's really helpful. Okay, so that kind of confirms what, what she said to me. And that, I, I had never really thought about it until that moment, which is terrible. Um, Cooper is indeed what most philosophers think of when they think of the body, most non-continental philosophers, because they think of the body as being precisely this kind of Cartesian uh, um, anatomical physiological machine, almost. Um, and not that it philosophically interesting. But um, we're mainly going to be focusing on life. Um, I take it that life and Cooper aren't entirely separable. That would be crazy to introduce yet another dualism into, into our philosophy when we try and get rid of them. That's part of what phenomenologists are trying to do. But we'll focus on life and the sorts of things that phenomenologists have said. Some very basic points, this comes from, from Husserl, is that the, the lived body is the, what he calls the zero point of orientation. That is to say, I'm at a certain point in space, but it's not the kind of objective space as measured by um, cartographers or, or indeed physicists or whatever it might be. Um, uh, things are in front of me, to my left, to my right, up and down, and so on. But all of those, uh, the coordinates, so to speak, of lived space are have one's body as uh, their as the zero point at the center. Um, and Sartre, Sartre um, talks about there being three dimensions, as he puts it, of the body. Um, I think he, there's more than he, he you know, more that he acknowledges without actually labeling them as such, um, and more beyond what he actually acknowledges uh, in being a nothingness, I should say. Um, well, he, there's, he, I just wanted to call attention to, first of all, the body for itself. Um, he describes this as the unperceivable and unutilizable center of the field of action, action and perception. Um, so we've already almost seen how it's the center of the field of, of action and perception, um, it, simply in terms of being the zero point. Um, but importantly, in, uh, for him, in, in most everyday engagements in the world, uh, the body is unperceivable and unutilizable. And you're perceiving from your body. You're not normally perceiving your body. And indeed, if you start perceiving your body or be becoming explicitly aware of it, it can tend to interfere with everyday action. Uh, if you're playing tennis, uh, at, you're fully engaged in the ball and your opponent uh, and, and your racket. But if you start focusing on your body, you're going to miss the ball. So it's unperceivable. It's also unutilizable. As Sartre says, I use um, the pen to write with, but I don't, in the same sense, use my hand to hold the pen. I hold the pen, and I write with it, and that's it. I'm not using my body. Uh, normally, we do. We do perceive our bodies, and we do use bodies, but in most everyday engagements with the world, the body is invisible, un unutilizable, always in the background, etc., etc. Um One dimension, or one aspect of the body, which I think Sartre doesn't really develop in being a nothingness, and I'd be inclined to say elsewhere, but the others may correct me, um, is uh, are some things that um, Merleau-Ponty brings out in his justly famous reconceptualization of the body in uh, phenomenology of perception, in particular. One thing that Sartre really doesn't thematize is the notion of habit. Um, habit for Meloponti doesn't just mean, uh, um, you know, the habit of smoking or, or um, brushing your teeth or whatever. It, it, it covers skills like, you know, learning to write, uh, you know, being able to write, being able to um, type, being able to um, drive a car, those kinds of things. Um, and he says a number of things about habit. Um, 
Cabot, he wants to argue that um, his whole project is both anti-intellectualist and anti-empiricist. Um, and he wants to argue that if you understand habit or you know, skill, motor skill properly, um, part of what goes on when you acquire a habit is precisely, this is the anti-intellectualist bit, precisely that you no longer have to think about what you're doing. When you're learning to drive a car, you've got to be thinking about it all the time. Um, you know, where do I put my hand? Oh gosh, I've got to be pressing on the clutches at the same time as I'm um, pressing on the gear shift and moving it forward. And, um, you know, gradually as you acquire the skill of driving, your body does the thinking for you, so to speak. You no longer have to think about it. And that's because the body is a habit body. Um, but also, it's anti-empiricist. I'm, I won't go into the arguments here, but you can't understand habits or skills in a kind of, a, a, a typical empiricist would be a behaviorist, and you can't understand the acquisition of habits and skills in terms of stimulus and response, because habits and skills are far more flexible. Um, they're not simply responses to physical objects in, um, in the world, but to meanings. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that's just, that's not a, an argument, it's just a sketch of an argument, but, but habits are, are, are very important. He, he sees, um, he sees temporality as essential to human existence, as indeed Heidegger does, but the body itself incorporates the ambiguity of temporality past, present, and future are all involved in the body. And the, the, the habit body is the body, this, the ways in which the body actually literally incorporates, takes into the body the past, the past history of repetition, of, 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 you know, of, of learning is then incorporated into the body. So, so that habit body is the body of the past so to speak, the past, uh, as it lives on in the present. Um, it's uh, in uh, his student, uh, Pierre Bourdieu's words, um, uh, history turned into nature that is forgotten as such. We forgot that, we, we forget that this isn't just the way things are, um, uh, that, that, that um, it, it becomes naturalized through, um, through the, the acquisition of habits. Um, I won't say too much about the body of the present moment and the, the, the futural body, but, uh, but I think there, there's going to be some aspects of that which are very important. Um, um, I said that there are ways in which Merleau-Ponty goes beyond at least the sort of being a nothingness. One is his, his kind of really, really serious engagement and development of the notion of habit. But there's another one which I think is equally interesting, and uh, um, which is the ways in which intentionality is bodily. Um, uh, Merleau-Ponty takes from Husserl, a distinction between uh, the intentionality of acts um, and operative intentionality. We don't fully need to know what that involves, but but operative intentionality is the, the intentionality which for Meloponti is the body's intentionality. And he um, Meloponti defines operative intentionality as um, uh, that by which comes about the unity of the world and of my life. Um, the, um, we can almost begin to see that, again, I can't go into detail about this, but the ways in which um, an action which previously 
of a series of actions which is previously fragmented, if we go back to my example of learning how to drive a car. So pushing on the gear shift and pushing on the clutch and moving the, the clutch forward, fragmented, becomes a unity through the acquisition of habit. Um, so, so, so that we get a kind of unity of action. Um, but the unity of things as well is due to the body. Things, the empiricists thought that things as they presented themselves to us were actually kind of, you know, redness and cylindri uh, cylindricality and or redness and blackness and silverness and cylindricality and hardness all these separate um, sensation, uh, uh, separate qualities coming in through these separate sense organs. Um, uh, and then it was somehow through association or something that we actually managed to see this as a pen. Um, for Meloponti, the body and its operative and intentionality unify the different senses so that we actually, instead of seeing, you know, um, red and black and silver cylindrical hard, we see a pen immediately. And that's all due to the body. So this notion of bodily intentionality um, in, in these two linked respects um, means that there's a you know, almost a, what could be called a bodily purpose. Meloponti does use that term. The body has a teleology it's aiming, so to speak, to make the world inhabitable for us. But if, if we didn't live in a world of unified objects, and if we didn't, weren't able to perform unified actions as opposed to these fragmented ones, we could not live in the world. The body has a teleology. And that's very unsartre, I think. Um, let me say something. We've already touched on this in other contexts. Um, uh, yet another. I'm switching aspects of the body like mad here. Um, what Sartre calls the lived body for others is very closely linked to his very famous notion that, that we've already referred to on a number of occasions here. Um, the notion of the look, the notion of shame. Um, he, uh, we know that um, when, for him, uh, at least in the ontology of being a nothingness, which requires the radical conversion, as we saw earlier, um, when another looks at me, he objectifies me in a certain sense, which needs a lot of spelling out. It's not objectifying me like a table or a chair, but there's a sense in which when another looks at me, I am objectified. But what he talks about, that what Sartre talks about is the way in which I live that awareness of being objectified by another. Shame for him is the paramount expression of the awareness of being looked at. Um, uh, linked, again, more sociologically to the notion of stigma. And um, I, I, you know, when, when I'm aware of being looked at in this Sartre way, um, it's, uh, I live my body as alienated, um, uh, you know, I, I, I want to hide, I want to become invisible um, so, so that I no longer live my body as this alienated object. Um, now, uh, what I'm thinking, uh, that, again to link up with some things that have been said earlier, uh, um, for sorts, this, this is the kind of live body for others within bad faith. Um, an authentic live body for others, I hope, would be something, this is kind of an I-it. Oh, it's almost an I-it. I'm aware, aware of being an it for the other, though that's not strictly quite the right way to put it. Um, maybe an authentic um, uh, relation with others would, would, would involve an I-thou. Um, but it seems to me that Meloponti's notion of bodily reciprocity is even more fundamental than an I thou. Um, for him, uh, he Meloponti talks. I, I, I'll try not to go 
beyond my power here. Miloponti does talk about, um, he claims that, first of all, we understand others with our bodies. And the, the image that he begins with, uh, uh, one image he uses, which is very, very striking, he, he famously talks about um, a, a, a 15-month-old infant. If I take one of its fingers playfully in my hand and pretend to bite it, it will open its mouth. Um, and he, he kind of ma makes sense of that by saying that um, my mouth, as it appears to the infant, I mean, what does the infant doesn't even know what its own mouth looks like. Um, so it can't be sort of arguing by analogy, gosh, when I open my mouth, I intend to bite. So maybe when my mother opens her mouth, um, she intends to bite or whatever. It's, it's much more immediate, non-cognitive, and bodily than that. Um, my mouth is immediately given to the infant as an apparatus to, to bite with. And it's, um, it feels its, its own mouth, as it feels it from the inside, is immediately given as an apparatus to bite with. And my intention is felt within its body as if it were its own, its own intention. This is, there's a sense in which he wants to claim that infant and mother are, they, they aren't I and thou, they're not even separate people. They, they are, um, hit my intention is the infant's intention um, in, in this kind of case. Um, and he says that, that you know, this, although you know, we gradually do, do learn to separate from the mother, blah, 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 that, oh, that sense of being at one with, I mean, again, mother, I mean, caregiver, um, uh, whoever that might be. Um, but um, we, we, we gradually become an individual with possibly an, a, a possibility of an I and thou relationship with Mel Pointy. But um, that, that kind of bodily memory of unity with the caregiver um, remains as an indispens indispensable acquisition in adulthood, he says. Um, so that, you know, by and large, we ver do very often continue to understand others with our body, especially others who are like us, and that's something that he admits. Um, members of our, cult our own culture, for example, we understand them bodily more easily than we understand members of other cultures. <coughs> but I don't need to go through any funny kind of, you know, I, I see, it, you see immediately that I intend to take up a glass and drink with it. So again, I think there's some interesting things in my point here there. Um, what neither of them say much about is, I, I mentioned that Meloponti sees there as being a, a, a kind of bodily intentionality and even a bodily te teleology. And, and what Richard Zainer brings out is the ways in which the body has its own teleology, which can be at odds with mine, so to speak. Meloponti's bodily teleology is very much supporting mine, if I can use that rather strange language. But, um, uh, so, um, this is a quotation from Frederick uh, Stenius, but he's picking up on Zane's notion of the body uncanny, where he talks about the alien nature of embodiment, which makes itself known when the body displays needs that I do not control. There's nothing mysterious about this, I, and it's, it seems strange to me. I mean, uh, Meloponti says almost nothing about pain, and those things that Sart says about pain are kind of not quite this. Um, but um, if I'm, to use one of Drew Lader's examples, if I'm playing tennis and suddenly um, feel a terrible pain in my chest, um, I've got to do something about it. It's, it's at odds. My body is making demands on me. It has its own 
needs and purposes, um, which aren't mine. I've got to stop. You know, I'm, I'm playing tennis, but I've got to stop because of my body's needs. Um, and what it, this is kind of one thing that's troubling about the body, and which is highlighted by this dimension of the lived body, is that the body is me, and it's also not me. Um, and not just not me, but sometimes, in a sense, opposed to me. You know, hunger. Um, uh, some people are better at transcending hu uh, hunger than others. Um, but those of us who aren't, if we're hungry, we've got to stop what we're doing and eat. Um, I'll mention also in this co connection, also, this is just um, gesturing, really. Um, Drew Later has a, a very well known book. Um, justly famous again, called The Absent Body. We noted earlier that the body in ordinary engagements in the world, we saw that with Sartre and his, um, you know, the body is the unperceived and unutilizable center in the field of uh, perception and action. That's, um, there are other dimensions in which, or other ways in which the body is normally kind of in the background or invisible. But part of um, Later's book is about the way, those moments when it comes to the fore, when it when it ceases being in the background, and some of these at least moments when the body comes to the fore, he calls disappearance, D Y S, indicate indicating that there's somehow something wrong. Um, his he thinks that um, we can describe Sartre's look as inducing a kind of social disappearance. Where my body, if, if I'm aware of being looked at, my body becomes the focus of my own attention. Uh, you know, I start worrying about, oh my God, is, uh, you know, do I look all right? You know, is my hair all messed up, um, or whatever it might be, uh, and can no longer focus on what I what I'm trying to say or what I, I'm going to be doing. I, I, that social disappearance, but pain likewise makes the body come to the fore. Uh, there are many other examples one might, might um, uh, mention that. Um, and then finally, I just want to say something very briefly. I'm, I'm no, no expert on, on Christina, just as another aspect of the, the lived body. Um, uh, as I said, she's not a phenomenologist. She, she's a kind of, um, I guess she's a psychotherapist, isn't she? Um, But um, as well as a, a philosopher, but so um, basically, her notion of the abjection and the abject. So the abject, I mean, this is a very crude understanding of Kristeva, but um, but what she says is surely undeniable. Um, the abject refers to detachable, separable parts of the body: urine, feces, saliva, sperm, blood, vomit, hair, skin, nails which retain something of the cathexis and value of a body part, even when they're separated from the body. Um, uh, I mean, each of those things has got some cathexis or value attached to it, even when it's separated from the body. Um, uh, and the reason why I think this fits in nicely to a phenomenology of the body is that the body essentially involves such abject things. You know, if essence is understood in the, you know, has to do with the way real human beings are in the real world. Um, the body essentially involves the abject. No, there can't be a body which doesn't urinate and defecate and have hair that grows and skin that grows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and hence, essentially, lacks stable borders. Um, that can seem, insofar as we are our bodies, our, that lack of stability, that lack of having stable borders, can seem very disturbing. And then abjection, again, there's a very crude understanding of the two, but is a transformation of the abject into objects of horror or disgust and the concomitant but necessarily unfulfillable desire to exclude the abject um, uh, and to acquire stable borders for the body and thus the self, a corporeal 
refusal of corporeality as uh, Gav Barsa puts it. I'm going to stop there because that's I'm, I'm just trying to bring it bring out some uh, as I say aspects of the real body uh, that we've got in the ethos. Um,